so we've gone through a little bit about the basics of the brain, but now we're going to talk a little bit more about behavior. What exactly is behavior? Behavior primarily consists of patterns in time. You wouldn't really think of this definition if someone was to ask you about a behavior, but at a very fundamental level, that's what it is. Anything, any behavior that you engage in is going to be a pattern of some sort across time. You can have innate behaviors and learned behaviors. Innate, the behavior that you're born with, learned behavior is obviously one that you're going to learn across time or as you, as a normal function of development. So here's some basic history on perspectives of the brain and behavior relationship. Um, sort of the earliest stuff was with Aristotle and mentalism, and this is that early, early on the mind is responsible for behavior. Then that gave, gave rise to dualism, which is primarily supported by Descartes. And the brain was the primary link between the mind and, be and behavior, but they are two different matters. Okay, and so this is Descartes that they would that you have these sort of separate systems and that the brain was the link between the mind and the behavior, but the mind and behavior were distinct. Uh, in materialism, this was primarily supported by Darwin. Uh, this is natural selection. This is something that most of you are going to be familiar with, the passing on of genes that supported survival. So um, you would have a particular behavior that would be um, advantageous. If there's genes that were associated with that behavior, they'd be more likely to be passed on. This, of course, get, brings us to genetics. We're going to be talking about this more later on. Genes are either dominant or recessive or intermediate, somewhere in between. There's two types of genes. There are autosomal genes, and uh, these are all other genes except for sex-linked genes, and then there are sex-linked genes. These are genes that are specifically located on the sex chromosomes. Uh, behavior and genetics there are uh, the primary way of investigating the relationship between those two right now is a field called epigenetics and epigenetics is concerned with changes in gene expression without the modification of the DNA sequence. So this is basically if you're not modifying the DNA, DNA sequence, you're not going in and actually, you know, conducting genetic modification, then this could be um, how the environment is going to cause changes in gene expression. Uh, if you experience stress or uh, chronic uh, pain or even um, if you become sick, if you have a, the flu um, or you, if you have an infection, this, these types of environmental things can actually cause changes in the expression of your genes. And these changes in gene expression can have a dramatic effect on changes in your behavior and your ability to adapt to your environment. Almost all behaviors have both a genetic component and an environmental component. And heredity is typically studied via monozygotic and fraternal twin populations. So monozygotic, these would be identical twins, and fraternal twins, of course, they're born at the same time, but they, uh, they are not genetically identical. So then you can understand the impact of environment on, you know, things that are genetically identical and things that are not. And so this can give you a range of the, you know, range of understanding about the impact of environment on behavior. So now we're going to be talking a bit more about how the nervous system evolved. At a very early, uh, very early on, um, the nervous system began with neuron and muscle cells. And then that um, evolved to include um, a more complex nerve net followed by bilateral symmetry and segmentation. Bilateral symmetry is basically, you know, we are bilateral, we have a right and a left side. A segmentation uh, is that our body has segments. We have arms, we have legs, we have a torso. Ganglia, these are going to be certain cells that um, actually support neurons in the brain. And then we have our spinal cord, and our spinal cord has all of the above. It has been, um, it has, it is segmented, it has ganglia, it has symmetry elements to it. And uh, finally, the brain was, um, is sort of the most evolutionarily uh, recent um, event as far as these sort of seven, you know, very early neurons, muscles, nerve net, 
you know, segmentation, the ganglia spinal cord, and the brain is sort of the peak of that evolution. All animals, therefore, share a common ancestor, okay? It is a misnomer that we are descendants from apes. Actually, humans are apes. We are related to modern apes through common ancestor. So think of the website Ancestry.com, for example. So I can go back and um, I can look and say, okay, well, it's very far back in my past, um, I was related to, I don't know, Genghis Khan or something like that. Well, Genghis Khan has, you know, he probably has a fair amount of offspring. So, you know, right now across the world, there's also someone else that is um, related to Genghis Khan. You know, so human and apes, we both share this world together, but humans, you know, we're not, you know, like, a, we're not descended from apes, just as I'm not descended from this other person who happens to be related to Genghis Khan. We both have a common ancestor. So this, this really gives you the structural understanding of how we can have uh, a common ancestor. Now, one of the things that I want to make clear is that this is a class of science. And so as I'm starting to talk about evolution, um, evolution according, you know, is fact, you know, this is scientific fact. And so we're going to be talking about evolution in this scientific context. I know that their uh, evolution is something that also has a uh, sort of a societal and religious aspect to it, but in the context of this class, we're only going to be talking about science, and there are some things that I could be talking about that are going to be a little bit controversial, um, that are uh, climate change, um, evolution, even some stuff with um, aspects of um, types of biases that people have. Uh, we're all going to be talking about these things in the context of science. How they um, arise, how they're important, and uh, that these issues and others are really important to people's behavior and perceptions, and that's why they're actually talked about in the news and the media. But I'm only going to be talking about things from the context of science. So a common term for animals with a spinal quorum and a brain is any type of animal that has both of those would be referred to as a chordate. So higher order animals are known as chordates. Chordate evolution is closely related to the evolution of the cerebrum and the cerebellum. The cerebrum is basically our higher order brain. You can see here this in humans, this is this is the cerebrum, our higher order, car, you know, we're primarily responsible for our higher order cortical function, excuse me. This is the cerebellum. So we have the cerebrum and the cerebellum. You can see here in fish that these are relatively the same. The cerebellum is responsible, um, has a huge impact in movement. So animals that have a very high, um, uh, that movement is very important for their survival and it's really critical for their survival and they're going to have more complex movement are going to have larger cerebellums and other types of higher order thinking and planning is going to be really uh, run by the, cere the cerebrum. Uh, then you have your frog which here has the cerebrum and the cerebellum. These are again um, relatively similar in size. Then when you move to a bird which has excellent memory, they are very social animals, they have a very long lifespan, then of course you can see that their cerebrum and their cerebellum, that their cerebrum is bigger than their cerebellum, um, but their cerebellum is still quite large. They have very, you know, they have um, flight patterns, they have very complex movements, and then when we move on to humans, then the uh, ratio, the size ratio between the, cer the cerebrum and the cerebellum um, the cerebrum is much, much bigger than the, cer the cer than the cerebellum. So new forms of locomotion on land and complex movements of the mouth and hands for eating, this improved learning ability and highly organized social behavior. So the more social you are, the more types of complex movements you would use, then your cerebellum would evolve. Well, you would, um, the social elements, these more complex movements that required planning, then your, cere the, your cerebrum would evolve in in um, 
concordance with that and humans being highly, highly social with forethought, able to, you know, anticipate what might be happening in the future, think about what's happening in the past, they have a much higher, much larger cerebrum. So why is it this hominid brain became so large um, in comparison to other chordates? Why does this, the cerebrum is so much larger than the cerebellum? So one of the primary things is the primate lifestyle. The foraging behavior of primates is more complex than that of other animals. Finding fruit is more difficult than eating grass or other vegetation on the ground. You need good sensory, spatial, and memory skills. So you have to be able to find it. You have to be able to navigate in much um, greater levels of three-dimensional space as opposed to grazing. And you're going to have to have much higher memory skills. Fruit eaters, therefore, have larger brains. Okay, so here's a class question. What was possibly, excuse me, the single largest determinant in the evolution of our ancestors? A, food. B, climate. C, development of tools. D, development of clothing. E, reproductive problems. Please take a moment to answer. Okay, so there is a very distinct relationship actually between climate and enlarging the hominid brain. Evidence suggests that each new hominid species appeared after new environmental changes. Okay, so after climate changes. So for example, the spreading of grasslands and fewer trees increased the adaptiveness of an upright posture and tool building skills. So if you need to forage and you are you know, you're in the grass, you need to be able to see over the grass. And you need to be able to also climb and access trees. So changes in climate are actually linked with uh, increases in cerebrum size for uh, primates that eventually led to uh, very early hominids.